So, yeah, getting this thing started, man. How would you describe what exactly it is that you do? You know, what is the way of peace all about? Right. Good question. Um, I basically show people or point people to the part of them that is most reliable. So we, we live in a very challenging world and most people try to rely on the appearances. So friends, family, them, their self, mm -hmm. money, relationships, and all of that is impermanent as the Buddha correctly and uh, timelessly said. So when you rely on these things, you, it's like it's like trying to rely on stuff that's always moving and it's just chaos. Yeah. But all of that is pervaded by our true nature, which I call the absolute, I sometimes call it awareness. And that's just an unchanging field of reality, which we are. So that is always with you. You're never away from that. You're never, it's the most intimate thing about you. The issue is that it's the only thing we're aware of that isn't a thing. Mm -hmm. And you think that would make it stand out, but it's the opposite. It makes it blend in it makes in it plain sight. Uh, exactly so when i so my conversations and they they're just conversations they evoke this recognition that there is something that's unchanging and that you can rely on it and all appearances emerge from abide as and resolve into it and they never stray from it so once you have that recognition it, it the, the awakening can be instant and and people often pay a lot of attention to awakening but awakening is really not that much uh, anybody can awaken it's, it's 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 just having someone point it out to you it could take like 10 hours more or less mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then once that's happened once you have that awakening what follows is your own period of practice of relying on it over and over again in all circumstances so you have an argument with your spouse and instead of fixating on the content of the argument you rest as awareness you rely on that part that's unchanging and it changes your speech it changes your thoughts because you align with a greater wisdom and you solve solutions in this way and for people it's it varies it can be it can depend on how much trauma you've had how chaotic your experience has been how like intense your causes and conditions are and some people are naturally very calm very stable and it's very easy for them to adopt to this but everyone does adopt over time so i teach people how to rely on that which you truly are and i will say it's not my invention the tibetans have been doing this for centuries and so have other practices, but I describe it in that way. I like to say, rely on that which you truly are. Wow. All said, man. Wow. Um, so how would we get more into why that is peaceful? Is it because it's something that is, it doesn't change, it doesn't fade away? Like this is this essence of what we really are, who we are, yeah. really are. It's like, something that we can rely on always and that's why it's peaceful yeah so my my, my channel was is I, I do play around with the names a bit it used to be mm -hmm. called the way of bliss mm -hmm. um my mother's made the name as bliss as well and it is really kind of more bliss but i find for for newer people bliss can be too evocative like it creates too much expectation yeah mm -hmm. and the translation of bliss from sanskrit to english doesn't quite work so bliss in ananda bliss is more like peace it's I the see. bliss of peace uh, where we think of bliss as like yeah uh, so uh, exactly yeah. <laughs> and where it's it's the it's the subtle bliss of peace uh, so the reason why peace is is so valuable is because it it's what well let, let's call it bliss for now it's what you're made of like the the entire realm of the absolute is made of bliss it is the default nature and i sometimes you know ask people it's kind of really really strange right just look at any object like inanimate object 
I don't need it to be happy, a bottle of water. It's just completely at peace, right? Every <laughs> yeah. appearance is just at peace. And if you have something, if you apply it to a more dynamic object, like a dog barking, it's at peace. Yeah. If you observe a storm in the sky, it, it appears at its peace, it's at peace. It's not trying to be anything else. It's not trying to fight what is. It's just expressing in its own way. And you can take that all the way to a supernova, which is like the largest thing ever. It's, it explodes as peace. And I say to people, if, if awareness, consciousness, can remain at peace while a supernova 10 trillion times the size of the sun explodes, then you can remain at peace while your own emotional storm is rising because the person in front didn't pull away from the traffic lights fast enough. Mm -hmm. So we are just simply the, 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 the absolute in this form, and we have a choice. We can adopt the behavior of our appearances, or we can adopt the behavior of the absolute. And that is our choice in life. And the more you adopt the behavior of the absolute, the more peace in, appears in your life, regardless of what's going on. It's not like you become peaceful and appearances change. Appearances stay as they are, but you perceive them in a more peaceful way. Yes. It's the changing of perspective, right? It's the, it's the, yeah, it's the, it's the undoing of the delusion, ah. which is the same thing, but it's a bit more specific. It's yeah. the undoing of the, of the delusion. So how would you say this in a general sense, undoing process, this choosing of the absolute looks in our lives? Right. It, it's really very interesting. Um, basically, the undoing or, or the choosing of the absolute, it comes about by a very simple practice. I'm just adjusting my volume here because something was wrong. That sounds better. So, <laughs> yeah. And so it comes about by a very simple practice and it's a mind blowing simplicity. <laughs> it's so silly, right? It comes about by leaving things as they are. And this is something that most humans never do. That whatever appears, we try to fix it, indulge it, play with it, etc. So that there's four things you can do with any appearance. You can indulge it. So an emotion comes up, you indulge it. I'm angry. Or you can avoid it. Um, oh, I'm just not going to be, I'm not going to look at that. Or you can replace it. Um, I'm a happy person. I feel good right now, like affirmations. All of these have a benefit. I call them antidotes. So some antidotes are non-harmful, like affirmations, guided meditations, seeking a friend, talking with someone. And then there's harmful antidotes, like using food, drugs, cigarettes, etc., to, mm. to neutralize these experiences. But the most powerful thing you can do is leave it as it is. And the reason why it's powerful is it, it demonstrates that no appearance has any power. So uh -huh. as soon as you engage in the appearance, you've given it power. So now you have to fix it. So if, if I've got uh, an, an annoying car alarm going off in, in the neighbor's garden or whatever, and I start to fixate on that, then I'm giving it power. I'm going to leave my room. I'm going to go downstairs. I'm going to try and stop the alarm. And, and, and it's going to become more emotive. I might fall out of my neighbor. If you leave it as it is, then what happens is you realize that that alarm doesn't have any power over you at all. It is just an appearance. And this is what the absolute, or this is what awareness does. So if you think of awareness like um, a body of water, like the ocean, the ocean doesn't resist what goes into it. You yeah. put a ship in it, that's okay. You swim in it, that's okay. There's a, an underground earthquake, that's okay. Everything is welcome. And that's its power. The same with space, which are all metaphors for consciousness, for awareness. And awareness always leaves 
everything as it is. It as awareness, nothing ever needs to change because everything is perfect as it is. So I teach this as a practice. And I, I don't mean your house is on fire and leave it as it is, or you don't have any money, so don't bother getting a job and leave it as it is, or you've got the cold and don't go and try to help yourself, or you don't politely go and deal with a situation. When I talk about leaving it as it is, I'm talking about your response. So so our, our mind is like a blank sky of awareness, and something happens and it is a, a firework. And then we proliferate it. We go, oh, the car alarm, those neighbors really annoy me. Why does it always happen to me when I'm trying to sleep? This is really frustrating. We proliferate this sky. Mm -hmm. And if you leave it as it is, what happens is the thought comes, the neighbor's car alarm. I've got to go to work and I don't want to. So you leave these emergencies, these, these core emergencies as they are, and what you see is they rise as awareness, they abide as awareness, and they subside as awareness, and they never stray. And it is this understanding that begins to percolate into your own power. So when when you are in, engaging in the world, what happens is that your relationship with your experience, the intimate experience that you're having, completely changes and that's what peace is that's what bliss is mm -hmm. that's what happiness is happiness is never something external it is always your relationship with whatever is appearing right now whether it's a memory an image of the future or a current experience when you heal or align your relationship with each experience along the same way as the absolute or awareness then the bliss of being just appears. They they call it Satchit Ananda, mm -hmm. the bliss of knowing oneself. It appears by meeting each experience just as it is. Wow. And then just to add the, 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 the qualifier, because a lot of people say, well, won't I go, won't I end up having a terrible time? There is also um, a nobility about it. Like when you do a silent retreat, you can do a completely silent retreat and someone comes up to you and you go, shh, which is just, it defeats the purpose. And there's a noble silence, in which case you're doing a silent retreat, but someone goes, do you have the time? And you tell them the time. In the same way, while you are relying on awareness, if there is an alarm that's going off and you need to do a podcast, mm -hmm. right? Then you just go downstairs, you knock on the door and you say, excuse me, would you mind uh, fixing your alarm because I'm trying to do a recording? If they say no, who do you think you are? Go away. You go back upstairs and you say to the guest, can we reschedule? It's not the right environment. So you just develop a practical positivity about your life rather than reactions. Yeah. Practical positivity. I like that. That's good. Yeah. So would you say that is like the big change that happens when we do identify and resonate and live from the absolute perspective is that our relationship with the world is just more conducive to peace. Like not only is it internal, but we also seem to be more peaceful with how we relate to the quote outside world. Yeah. You become an, an, an emanator of peace <laughs> yeah. in, in your environment. So, you know, I, I, um, and, and not always. So, there is this idea that um, I just want to qualify this first. There is this idea of a kind of black and white thinking that when you're awake, you're awake. And then if you're not, you're not. This this has not been my experience. And I, I've never seen it like that. Most humans, even if you have a profound and deep awakening and you practice for years, you can still be triggered. Yeah. So in the Tibetan schools, if you ask one of the really high lamas and you say, you know, are you enlightened? They say, I don't know because I'm not dead yet. Because <laughs> the ultimate appearance to face is your own demise and your entire training can fall apart. So if in different levels and in different environments, you will retain your peaceful uh, approach to life from this understanding. And what happens is what triggers you just gets further and further away. You can always be triggered by something, mm. right? But it just gets further and further away. So what you'll find is that 
you can be in difficult situations like family arguments or business uh, difficulties or relationship issues or uh you know things that just happen in your life around during the day and you'll be presenting with you you will find you'll have access to the capacity to re respond in ways that are mostly beneficial like that are the most beneficial to all beings mm -hmm. so uh, i'm just thinking of i'm going to make up an example like let's let's for instance say that i'm in a in in the line at the airport and i really want to get on because i want to get the best seat or whatever it is and someone appears next to me who i just i feel myself like oh, i want to get on so i can get settled and i feel this person's in a greater need than me i might spontaneously say like you know and people do this anyway this is what we do anyway when but this allows you to do it more often yeah. and it allows you to do it if you couldn't do it before mm -hmm. so like my my background is i grew up in gangs right i was in like london street gangs for the early oh. part of my life mm -hmm. and that was completely not conducive was with being a nice person yeah i don't <laughs> like, think so no. you literally you just self first it's survival mechanisms and self first and i just noticed through this process over many years that I started to become like a nice person and I mm -hmm. really enjoyed it. It was as, it's as simple as that. It, it It's um, like I was joking with you just before the call that sometimes I say my entire training for me was me to be more like Thai people because I live in Thailand and they're so gracious. They have what I call respectful relating that there is stuff that goes on behind closed doors, but in the public, there is this respectful relating with everyone. And I do that now. And when I was a teen, I was the opposite of that. So it makes you an, a, an element of peace. You become, a, um, in, in the tapestry of life, you become an, a node of peace. Mm -hmm. So it changes the way you react and respond to others. There are some drawbacks that can happen initially, but they also resolve eventually. What would the drawbacks be? So our ego is is a, is a mechanism that's completely essential for us to become a human being. Without without an ego, you would not become a human as such. Yep. So because the ego helps you define a boundary of what's mine and what's not mine. It helps me define who I am and what I need. It helps me survive in life get my needs met find a partner make friends like without the ego you couldn't really connect with people so the idea that the ego is some negative thing is 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 really not the case the ego is beautiful it, it, it's your best friend it's it's a wonderful mechanism of survival when you awaken the elements of your ego can can soften which is good but they can overcompensate initially because you're reconfiguring your whole world. Mm -hmm. So let's say me and you started a podcast business and you're awake and I'm not. And I say to you, I think we should make the logo blue. And you're like, okay, <laughs> like, why would you argue? Like what? It's a small thing. And I say, and I want to change the name. And you're like, okay. After a while, these okays, these okays, these okays, they can change the way people who aren't resting as awareness perceive you. In their mind, rather than them seeing you as awake, they can think you're a pushover. Yeah. Oh, I can take advice. Like it brings out, if they've got any kind of like wounding around this, it can bring it out. So what starts to happen, this happened to me for about three or four years. And I went from having a really strong ego to very weak ego and i found that my life was getting worse i thought that the world would love that more like when i was in the gangs you just i was i had my own way and then i completely overcompensated and it started to have things show up in my life that weren't i, I didn't think they were great as they appeared i rested with them so they are great so there's a there's a there's a two layer thing going on here because everything that appears is perfect and i was like what's going on here so i started to reconstitute my ego but now it was around much more meaningful um values that i would have my boundaries set to so it's like i rebuilt 
a, a new ego, but it, it was a it's a wise ego, mm -hmm. whereby I can really see what what would be better for for everybody here rather than the old ego, which was what's better for me. So this really helps in relationships because you start working towards the relationship rather than a transaction. If we yeah. was doing this podcast business, we would be working towards the podcast growth rather than my or your particular decisions about the color. So I say I you, I say I want it blue and you say, well, let's test it. <laughs> right. So this, yeah, these are, you I know, see. jokey art. These are small, these are small examples, but that's what life's made up of. Yeah. So it just allows you to become um more wise, but in the interim period, you can find yourself a little bit lost because the ways you used to respond no longer align with your current understanding, but yet you haven't quite developed the skill to integrate this awakening into your everyday life. So there is a bit of a period but it's worth it. Mm. And all of the discomfort that rises is actually just more of you appearing that you can rest with. So, so what I mean by that is we are a proliferation of experiences. And through the power of awakening, you can see through, clearly through some appearances more than others. And what happens is all the experiences that you can't see through those are the ones that start to appear they uh -huh. start to appear uh -huh. so it's it's all good but i just say to people you know let let's let's see how this goes and how this reconfigures because it's good to have someone to support through this journey as i said in in my world awakening is just like you know you're awake okay now what mm -hmm. the the, the mm -hmm. real journey is the what i call liberation which is the integration of this understanding into everything you do. Yeah. Well said, man. Well said. This is great. You're very well spoken. I really appreciate you coming on here. Um, I can tell you, you understand this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's really good, man. I don't even know where to go. Um, I guess I just want to know where this all comes from for you. Like, how did you, uh, how did you awake? If you want to just ask okay. like that, you know, like, where did yeah. you get, how'd you get on this wavelength? Yeah. Um, so I, be I believe that everyone is already on this wavelength. Like this goes a little bit deep, but it is, this is, this shows that I, if, if I'm going to say this anywhere, then this shows a good place. So everyone's <laughs> already awake. Uh -huh. They're already awake. There is, there is no awakening really because the absolute is everything. So there isn't any non awakening. So, and, and this is the great compassion. However, this confuses people, it annoys people. They're like, well, how am I awake? So the way I describe it, and I'll answer your deeper question in a minute about my own journey, but how I describe it is like, imagine that there's a grain of sand on the beach and there's a camera above this grain of sand and the beach, then the sand is like, I'm not a beach. I'm not a beach. I'm not a beach. And the camera is just rising up on, on a drone and it's just, the sand on the beach saying, I'm not a beach. This is what I feel when I see a human saying, I'm not awake. <laughs> it's just uh -huh. so silly. Right? Uh -huh. So that is the bedrock of this. So now I can share my story with, with that in mind, because I don't like to create a separation between someone who is awake and someone who's not. Yeah. The only difference between someone who is awake and someone who's not, in reality, is the person who is not awake has a thought i'm not awake <laughs> <laughs> that's very true i've never heard it put like that but that is so succinct yeah and all, my, my if you was to ask that question again at the start i would say my work is just to have people not have that thought wow yeah it's that simple that's crazy. just don't have that thought and just relax yeah. <laughs> so my own journey um as i said you know i grew up in a lot of uh what we might call trauma it was like poor poor very poor conditions in part of East London. And it was like, you know, crime ridden streets. And I fell into all of that. And I never really like was the central person, but I was around it for a good decade of my youth. And then I got out of that because it was just ridiculous. And then I went into uh, banking and I, I ended up working for Goldman Sachs as a trader. So it was quite a leap. 
Yeah. I was like living in a car and I went from living in a car to Goldman Sachs in like a few years. And to do that, all of my pri prior trauma was zipped up because exploring emotions is a privilege to people who, like most people in the West, to all people in the West, really, but to most people in the West, exploring emotions is a privilege. When you're in survival mode, you don't have time to self-reflect. Yeah. So yeah. I was in survival mode. How do I get from living in a car in a gang within a state to some kind of life? And I went through education and I got out. Once I became a banker, I had an apartment, I had money, the emergency's off. And all of this trauma started to just to pour up. Like I couldn't form relationships. I was arguing with everyone. I was riddled with road rage. I was angry all the time. I was I started binging. I started drinking. I put on like a hundred pounds. Like it was just murder. I was like, this is just terrible. And I reached a point where I was kind of clinging on to my career. And I'm sitting in my desk and I started, I came across this book called Love, Freedom and Aloneness because my relationships were the most difficult for me. And it was a book by a guy called Osho. And I thought, you know, what other books has he got? And I searched on Amazon. There's like 800 books or something. I'm like, how yeah. can this guy write so much? Like, I'd ne I never heard of a discourse, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I found out that this guy Osho was what's called a spiritual teacher. So I started reading his books. I really liked it. I then was in my job at Goldman Sachs and I decided to quit. And it was a big decision for me because I was like a bit of a hero in my local area for doing that, for getting into this career. Yeah. But I couldn't, I didn't, wasn't happy. I didn't like it. It was unfulfilling. And I knew they didn't have the answer. My answer was what is life? And Goldman Sachs was teaching me how to make money using like maths and stuff. And I was just like, this isn't my gig. And I left, I didn't leave with much but I left and I went to India and I went to the Pune center and I'm hanging out there and it's not so much any teaching, but I remember looking at a spoon and I'm thinking, I think the matrix was going around at that time. And I'm like, this is, this is actually not a spoon. <laughs> like it was so, it was so vividly clear that there was no spoon. And then I went traveling down south. So after you go to Pana for the season, you travel down to Arambal. And there's always a few spiritual teachers around Arambal in India. And I walked into one satsang and it was a woman called Nehru. And she's still around. She must be like 95 or so. And I went to her satsang and it was the strangest thing I'd ever been in. She has a really unusual style. First of all, there's all these like fluffy toys around and she sits on this chair grinning. And she sits there and she goes, this, <laughs> and then laughs. And then she's like, this, like she doesn't really say anything. She just points it out, right? Oh, wow. She's like this, and it just makes everyone giggle. But she has a chair you can sit in. And this was my moment. I sat into the chair and I asked, I started, I had so much, because I'm coming from being a banker. I also done like the did maths and stuff. That's how I got out of the streets. And I'm sitting on the chair and I, I, I had so many questions that she went, Shh, greet every question with thank you. Oh. And that is all she said. That was the end of my chat. And it was like in one of those old 80s science fiction movies where they told a computer to play tic-tac-toe with itself. Like it closes it down. By her telling me to meet all of my questions, which I had billions of, with thank you, my brain just started going, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just like, I just stopped. Mm -hmm. And I went to my hut in Arambal and I spent three days in this blissful state of being. And luckily I had my com computer with me and I wrote it all down word for word. So I have this really lovely text that is like 15 years or something. 19 years old or something and it was it's just literally a description of the initial awakening mm. and after three days i remember sitting there and i the first thought came back and it was like i hope this never ends chicken oh no don't end chicken oh where are you going chicken and i just literally went right down 
the other side. So that thought, how I describe it now, I didn't understand then, that thought was the hook back into self. I hope it never ends. Now I would leave the thought as it is. But I got on that train and it rode me back into the opposite of that bliss. And I just decided I'm going to dedicate the next whatever my life is to try and figure out what happened and how can I explain it to others or or, or instigate that in others in a more stable way. Because I, th- I love Nehru and all that she gave me, but I was very primed for that moment where the everyday person may not respond to this. Yeah. Like if you, if I went back to Goldman Sachs and I said, guys, this, <laughs> like, what is he talking about? <laughs> so she, I recommend if she's still teaching that people find her out because it's a wonderful experience to be with someone who creates that joy. But I wanted to figure out how can I transcribe that moment into something that's repeatable. So I've had many, many teachers that I'm all grateful for, probably like 10 to 15 teachers that I've all learned different parts from. But the majority of it has been me just practicing leaving things as they are over and over and over and over again. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. Because it is that simple. Just this. Just this. Just this. Wow. Just this. Yeah. You know, and um the, the 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 issue that I would say though, because I like people do love that. Just this. Sometimes people who discover the just this, they linger, they try to linger there in this no self nothing to do, yeah. nowhere to go, just this. And in my experience, that doesn't that that doesn't stay because you, you integrate it. It becomes a, a silent justice. And I sometimes feel like like I could have been teaching this work 15 years ago. And I think if I was, I'd be teaching more about the justice stage, but I I know what comes after that. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's mm. really, it's quite, um, it's quite unexpected what what follows because life, you you do live your life, your life comes back in, and then you become you again, and this this initially centered realization blends in to who you are mm. and i think to me that might be a bit less exciting than discussing the the thisness of yeah. of of awakening mm-hmm. but it's it's actually more beneficial because it teaches you how to be it in a way that is effective but less about you being awake if mm-hmm. that makes sense mm-hmm yeah so it's resonating at the thisness kind of like a secret agent like a 007 like you're resonating at that thisness but you're still playing your role here right? yeah because because exactly because i think that's where the world will, will will go yeah to awakening being just just this but it's it's not really such a big deal it, it would yeah. be more of a big deal to be not awake <laughs> or, yeah. or live through that because uh-huh. because what i was wondering myself is like what if everyone became a teacher <laughs> like who would who would make anything who would drive the buses who would fly the planes if everyone became a t- they had a just this moment and they just shared just this yeah like mm. there are like some people are really cool called to be teachers that is their that is their calling but I try to encourage people that, you know, when you do uh, realize your true nature and you begin to observe the benefits, um, one of the traps that can appear is, oh, I could be a teacher. Like I can have people look at me while I talk about stuff. And I think that's why I spent so long not teaching, like years, 
because I think it's imp more important to find out how can I really use this? Mm. Like, like, let's say I met an, another banker who awakened through these teachings. I might ask them that, and they say, oh, I should teach. I'm like, okay, but what about if you was also to teach by being a banker? Mm -hmm. First of all, you get paid a lot more than a spiritual teacher, yeah. but also you can really impact people not by your um, oration, but by your behavior. I think we should sell the crap out of the Turkish lira. Uh, okay, well, I've got a better idea, actually. We could do X, Y, Z and formulate something that's really beneficial and still people profit. So you see what I mean? I think that people who really dedicate themselves to awakening, it, that there is a little bit of a responsibility to, because now you're free, you you can place yourself in positions that you might have already left but you've got the capacity now to go back in and be really wise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it might, it's a bit too late. It was a bit too of a long period for me, but I think if I knew what I knew now, when I was working at Goldman Sachs, if I had the same understanding, I would have stayed and I would have become mm -hmm. a partner and I would have changed the, the one of the most powerful companies in the world. If I had that position, Instead, mm. I had to leave because I was under the impression that awakening is somewhere else. It's in India. And oh, it's yeah. really funny when people say this because it is, but it's also not. It's wherever you are. Yeah. It's just that we go there for that. If there was another place called, I don't know, Antarctica, was we would go to Antarctica and awaken. Like, it's not the place as such. Mm. It's, it's finding someone who can describe your true nature or ignite your true nature in you it's normally a person to person thing books yeah. some books can do it but they don't really go far enough this is more of an in person transmission mm -hmm. um you can get it from you from because of the way the digital world is now you can also get it from online but it isn't really a person it's 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 you it's you having the recognition and the one thing that i always teach is every circumstance is perfect for awakening anywhere where there's an appearance for you to examine that's your teacher mm. mm -hmm. yeah the guru is in everything it really is on your note of why people want to uh evangelicalize things speaking from personal experience is because it's the good news you know you kind of want to spread the good word you know, you just want to bring people along because it feels so good for yourself personally. So I feel as though in a sort of naive way, trying to say, hey, man, just this to people is a well-intentioned pursuit, but it's not that easy. You know, like you said, the person has to be open to it. So I think it comes from good intentions. And like I said, I'm speaking from personal experience. I tried to be sort of evangelical and save the world in that way and save everybody, save people. Um in that way in previous years but i realize it's, it doesn't really work like that um so yeah. yeah not everybody should be a teacher but i can see where it comes from you know it's because it's like we all yeah. it's the good news it's the gospel <laughs> exactly it's better to say that than to say not this right <laughs> yeah. it's much better yeah. to say that that all, all, all i'm pointing out is so the the the, the, the world of spiritual teachers has lost so much trust mm. for many people they some mm. people hate the idea that someone can be a teacher they're like i'm just gonna do it myself teachers are not trustworthy they're all scam artists particularly like the male teachers get a lot of uh um questions raised about their motivations and stuff like this because you you, you are you are elevating yourself when you are sharing a wisdom that others have yet to discover you are automatically placing yourself on a pedestal mm -hmm. and what what i've observed is that the, the issue with this is that you have this awakening and you think that's it but your traumas and your causes and conditions vasanas as uh um um ramana used to used to call them and gunas um they're still there 
And I talked to you earlier about how some appearances you're liberated completely and others you might not be. And I believe that most of the teachers that have fallen from grace, and there's quite a few of them, they came upon intimate circumstances where they hadn't found the clarity to see through them. So they succumb to these temptations that they that they think they're free of, and then they harm the reputation of teachers. And I think that it's such like the most precious thing a human has is their awakening intent. So if someone comes to a teacher with an awakening intent, there's nothing more precious than that because that is the end of suffering for all of life, one person at a time. And if you're not really established in your own um, awakening, like at least for a few years, then you can accidentally start to harvest the intent, the awakening intent for your own games. Mm really heavy service, really heavy worship, really heavy financial commitments and stuff like that. Now, I'm all for, for charging. I think that teachers should charge a lot for what they do. But I'm talking about the donation space. And I just feel we've seen it in the past that people start donating their whole life savings to something and everyone's in service. And when the teaching collapses, you might have 25 to 100 people who spent five years dedicated to some teacher and it all falls apart. And now they have no CV. They can't go out and get a job. What have you been doing in the last five years? Uh, so with what I do, I try to encourage people to maintain your, like, yes, become dedicated to the teaching, but also maintain your existing life. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because as a, as a teacher, I think it's the greatest thing you can do is share this. But when you do that, a lot can come your way that you might not be ready for. And this mm -hmm. is why I just kept delaying, delaying my teaching. Even now, I'm not fully on YouTube. What I post on YouTube is um, retreats I did a couple of years ago. I'm about to go full in on this. Wait, those but are all I just from felt, years ago? A couple of years ago, yeah. I mean, oh, wow. I've, got, I've, got, I've got tons of videos. I just never uploaded them. But... It's it's like I mean I making this content I could do it like ten hours a day and it, it's there's no barrier to that but I just would 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 recommend that anyone who has an awakening before they start like really actively teaching just allow yourself a couple of years to marinate mm. in your own way let it like like if you are truly free then you're also free to not teach immediately. Like, yeah. just let it <laughs> marinate. Just let it mar enjoy it. Like, have a little smile on your face and be helpful in your environment and in your family. Go to Christmas and don't have any arguments. Mm -hmm. Like, little things like that. Because what, what will happen is if you teach too soon, then you might start going on an arc that you're later going to correct but you're you're taking a group of people with you and if you've built up a lot of let's say for instance pretending i start teaching and i start going on the arc of it's all about the third eye and i start the third eye community and i do it for a couple of years and i've got a thousand subscribers and they're paying 25 dollars a month to be the third eye and then I realize it's got nothing to do with the third eye. Right? Yeah. How do I then unwind that school? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Without harming a thousand people. I've, I'm now stuck with this. And it all just can. So I'm not criticizing. I love all teachers. One of the things I love about your, your podcast is that you talk to so many teachers. And I had a look. I'm just like, I love these people. And many of them are really experienced just my little caveat to my own little community is that if you have an awakening and you want to teach just marinate teach in ways which aren't aren't you in it like in, a, in front of stuff teach with your friends teach in your relationship teach in your neighborhood establish some like get off the the little bit of a peak and i'll just say one last thing on this but don't do what i did and take 15 years it's useful in some ways, but I think you want to be close to the fire. 
So one thing I love about the new teachers I see is they're like this. And that enthusiasm is so infectious, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Where I'm teaching from a very mature space. Uh, and so it, it like you can, I'm a bit distant from that initial awakening. So it is really valuable. But I think just wait at least a year, you know, maybe two would be ideal. That's what I think. I waited too long, but some people are going in too soon. Mm, yeah. I think it's better too long than too soon, though. I do because, okay, that's a beautiful point. The biggest caveat, man, that's such a good point. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect we'd be talking about this, but it's good, good, <laughs> good, good, good topic. <laughs> the biggest caveat is this do no harm. Mm -hmm. So, that you, 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 I could start a spiritual teaching and I could say, well, it's going pretty well because 90% of the people are enjoying it. You, you can't, you can't risk corrupting someone's awakening intent if you turn someone off from their own awakening because let's face it only about 10 percent of the world's population is actually interested in awakening yeah and only about another you know 10 percent of that possibly pursue it vigorously uh -huh. if you upset someone's journey it's it's very costly mm -hmm. and they may not come back they may not come back to it so i just think it's really important to do no harm. And and I, I I try my best to live by that motto. We're all human. We can all make mistakes, but at least be aware that that's the standard. You're, you're going to make mistakes, but that's the standard. Yeah, that's a very good point as well. Yeah, it's very precious. You can't corrupt someone's intent in that way. It's very true. Yeah, I feel as though with that, you need a certain sense of maturity approaching this. So yeah, it's good yeah. to be in it a little too long and be better late, I guess, than uh, right. too soon. Right, so exactly. That's very good. So yeah. I'm going to go a little bit more and then maybe we'll change the topic, but I just wanted to say that everyone's different. Mm -hmm. Some people are so clear anyway that they just haven't had the realization and they are the instant awakeners. Like they're quite rare, but they just haven't had the the deep relationship with difficult appearances that some people face and they go wow and they are clear fresh present helpful benevolent and it's beautiful so so I'm, I'm not saying everyone treat everyone the same i was in gangs i was as a teen facing appearances that were extremely difficult plus i had a history of not being in control in terms of addictions. So I felt, I thought there's no way I am teaching anybody until all of that has been completely seen through. So, so I'm one extreme and I described the other. So I guess that the final part of this topic would be think about how you were when you was unawake, let's call it. And, and and how you was in the world was you benevolent was you uh beneficial was you harmful and think about will that show up as a teacher and if you think there is a risk take your time let yeah. yourself really shine in your own beauty and enjoy that process i loved it i absolutely loved it like this this marination process it mm -hmm. was just so beautiful because i would watch myself completely change and i'm like wow you can like you can change you know it's mm -hmm. it's amazing yeah it's very amazing yeah i mean how you've changed going from gangs to talking about this kind of stuff is a miracle <laughs> Seriously. Through, through goldman sachs as well right yeah through banking. It's yeah like it's two for one this stuff is real this stuff is yeah. real um to someone that doesn't know any better it may seem like just two crazy guys you know spewing forth some youtube content for views which it kind of is on one level but on another level it's we're, I'm, this we're just trying to be like a testament to like this is real and you you if your story is 100 percent true which i do believe it is you are the testament that this is real like this whole spiritual awakening or enlightenment whatever you want to call it man uh this the path whatever you want to call it, this process of purification in a way is 100 percent real and it's something for all of us to i was gonna say attain but it's not something to attain yeah. it's something to like to just become 
you know uh i don't know there's many different ways to say it but this is this is real man and uh yeah do you feel like in a simple way just just a happier individual i think you've probably mentioned it already in the conversation but overall like compared to when you were at goldman sachs and in the gangs before and after you know is the, is the proof in the pudding for you in, in terms of your happiness joy and in peace like is do you do you okay. feel that this is real in your life so maybe about tw 12 years ago um so maybe eight years after the Aaron Ball period something like that seven or eight years um I was in London and I was living in my brother's flat who has a mental illness and he can be quite challenging. I love him very much. He's like a Buddha in his own way, but he has quite a challenge in life. Mm -hmm. And I was living there and I was still very much uh, in food addiction and I couldn't really f function in terms of making my business work. I was having difficulty at the same time in relationships. So nothing had changed at that point. And I'm walking down, I'm about, I'm about 310 pounds, and I'm walking down Oxford Street in London, and I come across one of my uh, old friends. They're like, Joe. I'm like, hey. They're like, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. And I could see them thinking, uh, <laughs> how? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I looked a mess, but I was. And I'm so grateful for that period because it taught me that happiness has nothing to do with your circumstance mm. it is mm -hmm. to do with the relationship with your appearances and this comes in two ways and this is very very key it's extremely key and this is why that the marination or the liberation process is, is, is i emphasize that so there are two ways in which appear strong appearance they call them afflictive states there are two ways in which afflictive states clear through the awakening process the first way is at the at the at the results end so i'm having cravings to binge i'm binging and it's making me diabetic and unwell and giving me headaches but i'm free i'm free of the results so i don't have quite enough power to sit with the urge but i'm liberated from the results uh -huh. and that's where i was then i'm walking around i still don't have the power to guide my life in an effective way even though i was a banker it was very different your emotional life is very different from your intellectual life right so i'm not doing well but i am in bliss because i am free of whatever shows up mm -hmm. that bliss that you harvest of being free from what shows up on the results side over time feeds back into empowerment uh -huh. so that's freedom empowerment is awakening at the causation end so the urge to binge arises the urge to be angry for no reason the urge to whatever it is arises and you're free at that part part and if it like i'm i don't know i'm not unique in the world but i am in terms of how dysfunctional or disruptive or traumatized my life was so the experiences that i was facing were so dramatic that it took a long time for me to first find the freedom with these really challenging results and then that eventually percolating into freedom at the causation side which is still an ongoing process mm -hmm. but it's very much pr profound right now it's very much at an advanced stage but it, it's a beautiful thing to enjoy it's so beautiful to see this liberation which then empowers you so the freedom empowers you because what happens when you are free of the cause the, the results of your life so the negativity that shows up that means you can now approach improvement with joy. Mm -hmm. You're not sitting there going, oh, I suck because I didn't do my yoga today. Or I, you're like, 
wow, okay, that's interesting. Let's try that again. So you have a beauty, you now have a beautiful experience with your own empowerment, which I yeah. think is the biggest gift you can get. Yeah. And the one thing I'll add on to if you wanted to say something. Oh uh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. The one thing I'll add on to that is that that process is the the the, the liberation because and what it what it states is in my opinion that is the purpose if there is a purpose that is the purpose of suffering because nothing is more motivating if you are aligned in the right path which is what you asked me at the start what do i teach people to do to rely on the refuge over and over again once you understand that you now know where north is so now you take all of your suffering and you bring it into that alignment and then that's what dissolves it the problem we have in the world is nobody really knows what to do with the suffering and there is a thousands competing solutions and i've tried a large amount of them i've probably done a couple of hundred hours thousands of hours of all kinds of therapy i'm trained in eft i'm trained in hypnosis i'm trained in emd like all these activities i spent two years in a therapeutic community, banging cushions, shouting, doing meditations, at, like all of it. Mm -hmm. Nothing is as powerful as leaving it as it is. I, mm. I once did a skit and someone said, what's your superpower? And we was doing like an, an acting thing. And I was like, uh, like a superpower was like, leave it as it is. Because <laughs> I think it's my awareness, man. <laughs> Leave everything as it's it awareness, is. Awareness, man. <laughs> so that is the uh, that's the power uh, of suffering. Yeah. Suffering is your is your fuel to liberation. Suffering is grace. Yeah. Yeah, man. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So it's freedom at the affliction, and then freedom at the urge. And yeah. Empowerment comes from that. And would you also say you could take it a step further and say, through you know, through your lifestyle choices that you build through this liberation that the urges actually start to leave you, like your addictions and your attachments start to leave, not overnight, obviously, but the urges for, you know, the cookie or whatever it may be, start to dissipate a little bit in our life. So the, the, they do, but that part has nothing to do with awakening. So that's neurology mm -hmm. and biology. So if you change your diet, like I'm, I'm plant-based and I've been doing that for a number of years, that has helped me reduce all, all my cravings, but uh, I couldn't go plant-based until I result, until I allowed the cravings to be as they are at the results end. So it, mm. it's kind of like a catch 22. Like if you're really stuck in these addictions, how do you, ch how do you get to the neurology part? So um, this is this has raised a slightly different point, but I'd like to emphasize it because I think it's really interesting. When I first went to that Osho place, they had me do this process called Fresh Beginnings, which is 25 days of real deep Osho therapy, looking at yourself, looking at your life, letting out all of your emotions. So you do 25 days of preparation for a three-day Vipassana. I got onto the Vipassana mat and I was asked to leave in a in a nice way because I couldn't sit still. I'd never closed my eyes before, right? So then they're like meditate and I start doing this and like the body tension start and I just, they're like, do you want to go for a walk? So I had to walk in the garden and I just, I could not do it. They asked me to leave. And I was like, wow, I am so messed up. I can't even meditate, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So there is a group of people out there that can't do any of these practices. Like in the world in which I inhabit now, people do yoga, people do meditation, people go to breath work. But the people I grew up with, they cut their, their body is in such a traumatized state, they can't even do yoga. Like yoga used to, like, <laughs> I'm going to say it now. Yoga used to make me furious. Like I'd, I'd be in a, in a yoga position, like whatever, some position, and the teacher goes, and we're going to count to five, one, two, 
uh, Jeremy, if you just move your foot forward and your arm, and I'm like, why are you talking to him? What number are we at? It should be five, not six. And I'm like freaking out. They don't know that, right? So sometimes these practices, they're too, even the most basic, sitting down is too much. So I decided, that, and that's why I got so committed to this non-dual path, because it didn't require me to meditate. It didn't require me to do any practice. All I had to do was leave everything as it is. And over the years, I changed, my body changed. I changed. And now I can do yoga and I can meditate. But I just started meditating. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think meditation came about because people who were awakened started going, wow, oh, wow, this is amazing. Right. Mm. And then other people would see it meditating and say, well, I'm going to try and meditate. So it's backwards in. It's It can be effective, but it's backwards in. So I like this approach for people who can't enjoy normal practices. Don't push it. If you can't meditate, if you can't do yoga, if you can't go to these other things that are meant to help, don't worry about it. Leave that as it is. Leave your thoughts about your meditation as it is. Leave your thoughts about your crappy yoga as it is. Leave your thoughts about the word crappy as it is. Leave it all as it is because that is the, the gateway for you to heal. I do think the body work practices are really important. So I've gone back to them. But in the initial stages, they can be just too traumatizing for people yeah. where this is just compassion upon compassion upon compassion. Mm. That's what it's all about. Mm. Compassion. Mm. Yes. Yeah, man. That's good stuff. This is awesome. Uh, I don't even know where to go from here, man. Uh, <laughs> this is good. We can just go leave it as it is. <laughs> yeah, I think we can just leave it as it is at that. Leave it at compassion, right? Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do you do you want to wrap this up? Do you have anything else you want to say? Sure. Most of the ideas that people have about awakening is from an unawakened mind. It, it doesn't understand what it is. So it thinks it's a thing. It thinks it's um, an object to be obtained. Yeah. It isn't. So I'm going to share with you now, to wrap this up, an introduction to your true nature. Mm. And some people this really resonates with. So let's see. So I'm going to pick up two random objects. I've got an, uh, an AC controller. And I've got a phone. And I'm just going to ask you a question about each, then a third question. And just go with your first response. Mm -hmm. Right? Are you aware of this remote control? Yes. Are you aware of this phone? Yes. Are you aware? Yes. Right. Why did you say yes? Just, I don't know. It's quite apparent. It's like, do, right. I don't even have to it's answer It's quite that. apparent. It's yeah. quite apparent. Mm -hmm. So that, what you looked at, is your true nature. Mm. It's an instinctive knowing. You didn't have to look at an object. It's It just appears as a yes, as affirmative. Uh. That is the absolute. That's how close it is. So it's the only thing that exists that is not an object. So that is what I teach people to rely on, that knowing sense of awareness. And it's always with you. Is it there now? Of course. Mm -hmm. It never leaves. So this mm -hmm. is the starting point. Wherever you are in your spiritual journey, whatever struggles you're having in your life, whatever confusion there is about this, that, and the other thing, wherever traumatic situation you're in or wherever you are in the world, you can always turn to that which never changes, your own instinctive sense of awareness. And just rest with that for a few seconds mm. and continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so well spoken, Joe. This was awesome. Um... It was great to chat with you. And I wanted to say I really appreciate your dedication to 
gathering us. I didn't know about this channel until you contacted me, mm -hmm. but this is like a hub of all of the smaller spiritual teachers around the world. And you've got like <laughs> 368 videos. I adore your commitment and consistency. That is a really beautiful quality. So keep up the good work. Thank you, man. It's an honor. It's only possible because you said yes. And people like you said yes and come <laughs> on here and put up with me for an hour. So yeah, man. That's great. Um, yeah. Keep on doing your thing. Seriously. Um, I'm actually you. quite surprised to hear that your videos were years old. I thought you were just putting them up recently. That's pretty amazing. So I encourage you to, you know, I, you don't have well, to listen to me, but I encourage you to create more if you I, could. I, the, I'll just quickly end with this is that mm -hmm. I um, have been, I'm now planning to go full in on this. Mm -hmm. I had some other commitments to wind out. So I thought, you know, let's, let's, um, populate my channel with with the talks that I've been doing. I'm here in Chiang Mai. I will be holding live talks here again and doing a lot more live on my channel and also making regular videos. It just took a bit of a while to really get to the point where I'm like, okay, this is mm. it. Mm -hmm. So I'm here. Let's go. I can't wait. <laughs> All right, buddy. You have a great day and Thank I'll speak you, to you next time. You Cheers. as well. Cheers. All right. Okay. Have a good day. Peace. Peace, everybody.